Hi everybody, welcome to the support stream. I'm Alexander Pascal, and joining us today is Ryan Brooks, senior technical artist. He's gonna be showing off the awesome new foliage uh, volumes that are gonna be coming in 4.8. And uh, I'm just gonna let you take it away and show them what you got. Hey guys, so we had a lot of cool new engine improvements in for uh, 4.8 in order to make the open world demo for GDC. And a, a couple of those big systems to just uh, give an overview are, um, one is the procedural foliage tool, which I know you guys are mostly waiting on information about. Uh, that basically is a way that allows you to simulate the generation of foliage uh, per species uh, through the spreading of seeds. And that kind of works through a random seed system that does an initial random positions, and then each seed has some settings for spread and um, random chance for how, how they'll spread, whether they'll grow in shade, and all, all those sort of things. And um, and the other system that we used for that was another big improvement was a way to automatically spawn grass on the landscape layer um, using different layers in the landscape material. Um, and basically the reason we went that direction for grass is that it's just way too many actors to spawn for, for each blade of grass to cover, you know, 100 square miles. It becomes billions of actors. Mm -hmm. So for medium to large scale objects, we use the procedural foliage tool and we actually save positions in actual actors for the final tree placement, whereas the the final small grass and little teeny pebbles and stuff like that will usually end up being more of a, uh, a deco object on the terrain material itself. So hopefully we'll kind of get through an overview of the differences in those two systems and, and the basics of setting them up. So um, to start off, I wanted to show you guys just a real simple example of the procedural foliage tool in a simple test map just to get an idea of how it works. Um, so as you know, it's, it's volume based. So here we have a volume that was thrown into this simple little test map that just has a flat ground and it has one species of tree that was just uh, grown to a few steps just to show what it looks like and then I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it and then uh, make a new one from scratch just so I know that's what you guys want to see so down over here we have the procedural foliage uh, spawner so this is the actual container asset that contains all of the list of foliage types that we want to use so I'm gonna click this open right now and you'll see that it has right now one thing under foliage type, and that's just one of our trees. And I'm just going to add things to this as we go. And there's a couple settings in here, um, such as random seed and tile size, which I'll get into a little bit more information about that in a little bit. But for now, I'm just going to show that you can drag these in the world, and it automatically creates one of these volumes for you. Although the volume is going to be pretty small by default. So I'm going to go ahead and make, make this thing a little bit bigger, maybe about 100K by 100K. move this guy around. We also want it to be big enough so that it intersects the ground. And then we see it already has, down here under procedural foliage, it has our forest thing, or our, fo our forest um, procedural actor. So we're going to click simulate. And so what that did is it went through every type of foliage in this list and saw what its settings were and did the generation for them. So I'm going to now jump over to one of the foliage type settings which we can get to either, you know, by following the reference in the actual um, procedural foliage container, and we're going to pop that guy open. And that's so and that's something they'd have to normally uh, create first in order to populate right. that. Yeah, maybe list. I should show it actually how to create that as well. Yeah, so, so it'll is it in miscellaneous right now or so right now? So to create the procedural foliage actor, which is the container of everything, ah. you'll oop, excuse me. Hit, hit the wrong thing. You'll want to make new and then expand classes and type proc and you'll get procedural foliage spawner. And then we've got them there. I'm going to hit escape because I don't want to have two things and cluttering it up. And for making the actual foliage type, it's the same thing. So, so these are just um, blueprint classes that you'll be making for it. Exactly. All right. Um, so the one we want for foliage type is actually the, the bottom one here, foliage type underscore instant static mesh. Um, so creating one of those will give us the same thing we have over here, but I'm not going to recreate those from scratch. Okay, so here we have our foliage type for hill tree 01, and obviously the first thing we have is a mesh, and then placement settings, which you're all probably pretty used to seeing in the existing foliage paint tools, such as align to normal random pitch and stuff, and usually you don't really mess with that for the procedural system. The meat of the settings comes under, obviously, procedural, 
under clustering, collision, and growth. Um, the big one for how your final simulation is going to come out is mostly going to be under clustering. So we can see here, there's an initial density, there's some spread settings, and the probably the biggest affecting settings here, uh, other than the initial density, are the number of steps and the seeds per step. So you can see here that this is five steps and five seeds per step. So that means at each iteration, each tree has the chance to spawn five children. So I'm going to go ahead and set that back to one for number of steps and re-simulate just to show our forest should get a lot thinner at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and select our forest volume here, click simulate. So now we can see our forest looks a little bit kind of underwhelming at this point. And that's because w at this point we only have um, one step done. If I set this to zero steps, we'll actually only see only the initial seeds. So this initial seed density is in per 10 meters by 10 meters. Uh, so the fact that we have this by at about 0.06 means, you know, every few 10 meter patches you'll see a tree, which, you know, that looks about what we're seeing here. And as we'll step through the number of steps, oops, let's go, go, you know, one, each tree had a chance to, to spawn five, um, and two, again, each one had a chance to spawn five. I'm just going to jack it up to five, which is where we had it. And um, so e each had a chance. And you notice I'm saying has a chance to spawn. Um, it, it's not guaranteed, guaranteed to spawn them because under collision, uh, each tree has a collision radius and a shade radius. Um, the collision radius is m meant to represent the actual trunk of the tree where you would never want anything clipping, such as other little rocks and dead branches. You don't ever want them to be intersecting with the, with the uh, tr trunk of the tree. So the collision radius blocks everything. Shade radius, however, is different and usually is the canopy width of the tree, or sorry, the canopy radius. Um, and that's used if you want to have species that are allowed to grow in shade. Um, and that is down here in this grow in shade option. So for trees, you don't want them to grow in shade because you want them to use their canopy size as a way to evenly space them so that they're not, A, just wasting overdraw with leaves inside of each other, and B, you know, just going to look ridiculous if they're too dense. Um, but with this system, you can yeah. just easily kind of have trees and then have small bushes around them as the shade um, foliage. Exactly. So if you had a, a awesome. bush class that was set to grow in shade, it would be able to grow within the shade radius, but not the collision radius of these trees. Um, and I'll actually show that when I start adding some types. There's just a few more settings to go through under here. Um, and you'll notice that as I'm changing these number of steps and re-simulating, the overall randomness is staying the same. Um, Let me see. Sorry. And that's based on the actual seed of the um, procedural foliage. Sorry, I'm having trouble reading some of the some of the text on this thing. Oh, there we go. Distribution seed. Sorry. So if I change distribution seed to one and re-simulate, now I should get a totally different pattern. And that allows you to kind of lock in the, the clustering shape that you want without having fear that you're going to drastically change the entire shape of your level every time you simulate. And that turns out to be really useful for debugging as well. And um, so what I was mentioning before, as this simulation is running steps, for each seed it picks a random distance from the parent tree using the average spread distance. Um, and then the spread variance, which is kind of like how much plus or minus that average will tend to be. And I, I believe it's using a normal distribution under, under the hood, but you don't really need to know what that means if, if you're just here tweaking, tweaking values. Um, so, so basically, some of the trees that are spawned will be instantly killed because the spawned random location is already intersecting with another tree. So that keeps things from getting out of hand. But just to show you how the effect of the radius is, if I change this average spread um, distance from 1,000 to 1,500, that's going to actually allow many more trees to be generated from this same simulation because the trees will be farther apart and there's less of a chance of the trees killing each other's seeds. So just by increasing the distance, not only did I get a bigger cluster, I got more clusters or more seeds as, w as well. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're tweaking these settings that changing something like, y you could actually have a, a really high number of steps if you had really bad spread. So you had like one for spread distance. You could have a million steps and it probably never would actually succeed. And then you might come over here and change spread distance, and then you'd be shocked how many trees you had. So it's, Im it's important to kind of fudge around a little with these until it looks right, right? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to go change just one parameter way high, but you know, kind of build things up slowly to get the look that you want. 
is usually a safer bet. Mm. Um, so the other thing didn't go over yet is, so there's min and max scale, and these are under growth. So what that actually means is, so as we're running through these steps of the simulation, the, in the initial seed, which again, if I re-simulate with one, so if I step again, in the second iteration, this initial guy is now the oldest tree because he's the parent. So after five steps, the tree in the middle of the forest is actually five steps old, as, as you can call it. You can think of it as, you know, the units doesn't really matter. But um, in here where it says min scale and max scale, so the older the trees will tend toward this max scale variable. And also, you can set the, the maximum age that will even matter. And you, you can also change the curve distribution of sizes that goes from young to old. So on the left, we have the size of a young tree. And on the right, we have the size of an old tree. And this would look up the value of that, um, what size it should be, how far along it is between the um, min and max scale. And that's when it's default, it's just linear, obviously. And sometimes you can give it kind of a round curve to change the, how it's going to look. So I'm going to just really quick bring back a few seeds or a few steps and show how if I have a uh, max scale just at one, you'll see that these forests get a lot less interesting because every single tree is now the same size for the edge. Whereas, you know, if we boost this max scale up a little bit to you know, 1.5 to 2, oop, and re-simulate, you see it started to get bigger trees in the middle and that also caused a lot of less trees to be born because there was more more trees filling up the same space. No, so the collision. Yes, the collision, collision scales with the growth, is yeah. which is important. Yeah. Um, so y there's, a, there's a few settings to kind of tweak to hone in on the look that you want. Um, hey, uh, why don't you mess with the curve a bit and show them what you're talking about with the, uh, yeah. you know, if you want to have it so that basically they're really small when they're young and suddenly they shoot up or it takes them a while and then, you know, when they're really old, you know, you can have some there real great control over the aging of your foliage. And I apologize for my clunkiness. It's always tricky to use these demo machines. <laughs> All right. So that should basically fill out the center density of the forest a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to tell. It's based on the uh, spread variance, you won't get the shape you want. But it's definitely possible to get these uh, very nice round forest clusters using that setting. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go ahead and show what it might be like when you add different uh, species into your um, procedural actor list. So right now, we only really have the one hill tree. Um, but you typically would have at least, at least a couple different species. Um, if not just different types of objects. And we're going to keep it pretty simple for this and just do different types of objects. So I'm going to add in a type for a, uh, a large rock. And I'm going to go ahead and simulate and show what's going to happen is that these two types are now going to compete for space. So what it looks like happened is now we have almost no trees and a bunch of rocks that took over. And there's a reason for that that we can actually change the behavior if we want. So if we go into our, um, I'm going to go back to our tree real quick. So the one setting that I did not discuss here previously is this overlap priority. And what overlap priority does is if there's two different seeds that are trying to write to the same position in the same pass, whichever one has a higher overlap priority just wins by default. So because both the rock and the tree have overlap priority equals 0, um, that just means whichever one happened to be the last checked was one. So the rock one in this case. If we go to our tree and we set overlap priority back to one, uh, I think I have the tree selected. So now what we have is the original tree pattern is untouched. The rocks were able to spawn in and they just did overlap testing um, actually based on the shade radius because we didn't check grows in shade. And if you think about it, a rock really shouldn't care about whether or not it's in shade. So for rocks and things like that, it's pretty much always a good idea to, to use grows in shade. Um, we might or might not see a difference in this simulation depending on that because it has a lower priority. But we should see maybe a couple rocks show up in the, uh, oh, uh oh, usually doesn't take quite long. It might be doing more checks because we're telling it to actually check within all those. Well, this doesn't seem quite right. Sorry, bear with us for a second. Hmm. 
Uh-oh. Looks like we no. may... It's, it's hard to tell if this actually is going to complete or not at this point. <coughs> well, we might have to revert. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry, uh, <laughs> things have changed recently and it's acting a bit funny today. Yeah, I guess I'm just gonna go ahead and restart it. Let me see if it's actually doing anything. It's still doing something. The question is... If we need to, we can just, um... Start over. One. Yeah, we'll we'll load up the uh, the other map where it's all, all right. kind of loaded all in. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sometimes that's it's risky running lots of steps. Okay. Where is the editor shortcut? Do you know? It's you a take over for me. It's a way down on the left. This guy? No, left one. Here, why don't you take? Yeah, you want me to? Yep. Yeah, Here, I, I can know. set us up again really quick. <coughs> Sorry about that, folks. Having kind of a fluke. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was kind of an overview of just the really basic settings of how the different uh, types interact with each other. Um, the other thing we haven't really shown is how this works in an actual landscape level. And we have another kind of somewhat simplified uh, landscape demo that's a little bit smaller than the kite demo map just for loading time purposes um, that shows how you can use landscape layers to mask where each species is going to show up. And I, I definitely saw that question asked a few times in the, the thread. Um, so you can actually supply more than one landscape layer mask per foliage type. Um, and that can be pretty useful if you have different things, like you want to exclude, maybe you have a mask for roads in landscape and you want them to not draw on roads. You should be able to do that. Um, as well as we'll go over the grass system and how, how we can hook that up in landscape. Okay. All right. Now you should be able to just scroll down. And you'll see the uh, GDC. Oh, there you go. That works too. It's th it's the bottom one. Bottom one. Gotcha. Otherwise, you'll end up with Alan Noon's tank. <laughs> <coughs> That's a different stream. So, are there any uh, any questions coming in while this is oh, loading? Oh, yeah, we have plenty of questions coming in here. Um, they're in your other monitor. Yep. Yep. So, scrolling down to the Q and A section, you can also make sure we get some of these knocked out while we have a second. Yeah. So the first question here is, I noticed that gusting was added to the wind actor. Any chance we'll see more of these parameters exposed? So that is actually a setting that is specific to, um, I, b I believe it's, it's for speed tree. Mm, I'm not sure okay. if it also affects everything else or not. Um, but I'm not sure what the other plans are for wind at the, this point. So we'll have to get some more information there. Yep. Um, yeah, a lot of people have been, I actually found a couple of people asking about if they can use the foliage volumes to spawn towns and buildings uh, together to make like little towns, but I don't know how exactly that would work. So currently, the procedural foliage system is just using simple static meshes, and it relies on the fact that there's just a simple collision radius there, not any actual big collision holes and stuff, to be able to quickly do those overlap checks with each other. Um, so right now, this one is not something we can do with the procedural system. Um, and the next question is, does it account for erosion? If I have an area with dense trees and another without, will it help create a natural looking erosion? <coughs> so the, the map that we're loading up should um, help show that a little bit. Basically in that case, what you would want is to have a, um, a landscape alpha that was rendered out using the erosion map as well. So if you're, if you're getting erosion, it means you're probably getting it somewhere from World Machine or, or like that, so you can export out the erosion maps and um, in your landscape material, create a layer sample. Um, and you can actually create layer samples in the material that aren't even hooked up to anything if you just want to import a bunch of random stuff for use um, for the grass system um, and, and also for the, foli for the procedural foliage system. So that's something I've done a few times is just made a temporary landscape layer sample um, you may have to reapply the landscape material to the landscape before you see that new, new um, material sample show up. But then you can import uh, weight maps and then use them for foliage or, or whatever you want to do with them. Um, and then, of course, if you're trying to actually... I, I believe they won't be cooked, but I if you want to be sure, you can actually just delete them after you're done generating whatever procedural stuff you wanted to do with those. And I'm just talking about masks that wouldn't actually be 
used in the rendering of the terrain so that you don't en end up with a million layers just to achieve something simple. Um, I think it's loaded up now. Is it? Oh, yeah. Sorry, wrong monitor. All right. Is it? It is not. Where it's acting like it is? Yeah, it is not loaded up. Huh. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's very odd. Here, you want me to Here, take a look at this? Around. And I'll move it over to the question so you can keep Yeah, we'll, we'll get some, that. some back to the <coughs> form questions while we're trying to figure out what's wrong with the editor. Some of the problem here might be that we're loading the entire GDC um, demo branch, which has a lot of content, and it hasn't really been loaded on this machine much before. Um, I'm going to pull up that other thread page. Oh, here it goes. It, it decided to wait until I was starting to force close it. So there's a question, do the foliage meshes act as instances, or are they separate static meshes? So that is probably more of a question for our rendering guys who, who wrote the new hierarchical foliage system. But I believe the simple answer is that they're instanced, but they, they render through a new hierarchical instancing system. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of a new type that dynamically clusters the foliage based on the LED distance. So we no longer have that problem of foliage LODing based on the big, huge size of a, of a cluster. Um, they will LOD based on their own correct size now. Oh, and here we go. Yep. So where was it? It was, just, it was just hitching on us? Yeah, it was, it's, well, it's just yeah. this huge map. Yeah, we were loading a pretty big map, so. <laughs> yep. All right, so. It's actually pretty uh, impressive. Is, is this from Kite, or is this just no, another huge? No, this is, this is just a little uh, landscape demo that I put together for this um, in World Machine again. And I think this is probably about the qu a quarter the size of the Kite demo. So that means it's about... Um, eight kilometers by eight kilometers. Um, and it's, yeah, I didn't really try to make it beautiful or anything, but the thing that I wanted to show here is that, see, we have this mask for kind of this uh, brown dead leaf texture. And the foliage volume here is s configured to, um, to only put trees inside of that mask. So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate that. So, um, so under placement, the top list of settings that you get under foliage type for each species, you have an expandable little section, that's why it's easy to, to miss sometimes, um, called landscape layers. And notice this is an array. Um, so here I typed the name dead leaves, and that's just the name of this uh, dead leaf material on the landscape. And I could type more than one layer if I want, but in this case I only have the one that I care about. Um, so it's only going to place those trees inside of that layer. And we can crank up the density a little bit just to kind of show. Because in, in this case, it's really designed that we want trees to pretty much cover most of this dead tree f texture. Um, so go ahead and increase the steps a little bit and just re-simulate and see what it... So the much denser like clusters now. It's looking nice. So yeah, you can also increase the seed density as well to kind of fill in this initial volume if you want to. And it might take it a minute because I'm asking it to generate quite a few trees at this point. I'm basically asking it to fill in the entire or most of this this patch. Of course, we'll have to wait and see what it what it came up with. Give it a second. It is creating millions of things. So here we have pretty quickly blanketed most of this level's forest floor texture. Um, and we can go down here, and this is actually one of our kite demo uh, photo model textures that we will be releasing in a asset pack pretty soon. And if you actually take the time to polish up your lighting and balance the materials, you can you can get some pretty gorgeous stuff with with these assets pretty quickly. Um, so just to you know, flying around this huge forest, yeah. There's there's a few world machine 
hiccups in this file here and there, but it was more meant just to, to show the power of the masking and the clustering, how they could kind of combine. And so um, we could also at this point start to add a few things back since we only have the one tree in our, um, in our list. If I go ahead and add in, for example, our, our rock again. And the rock is not set to, to uh, mask by the layer, which is nice being able to control that per species. Um, so I've got huge rock. And there's also um, this other one I'm going to put in, ground deco. And that is another one that I'm going to just show real quick. This is kind of a dead tree branch that, uh, oops, clicked the texture instead of the mesh. This is one of the assets as well that was used in the kite demo. There's actually one, you see it right behind us on the screen there. The kid jumps over this, this mesh really close up oh in one yeah. of the shots. So it's one of the prettier assets that we had uh, photo modeled. I believe this one came from, from the UK. All right. I accidentally loaded a texture that wasn't actually referenced in memory, and it was an 8K texture. So sorry about that. That's what's, mm. that's what's happening right now. Another thing this material is doing is using um, a mask for where these pink flowers show up. That is, as well is a texture that came out of World Machine. Um, and that's something that's kind of similar to the question that was asked about using erosion. Um, in this case, it's kind of the opposite of erosion because I made sure it didn't go in the erosion lines. But it shows how you can use that, the uh, material to drive foliage. Okay, so that's the texture for that log. And that's the actual, the actual asset. So I just added this to the, to the list of meshes. And it's also set to uh, grow in shade, I believe. Yes. So this is kind of a nice thing that you'd pretty much want to have wherever you have your, um, your other trees. Not you wouldn't really want these out in the middle of the grasslands too often. So I'm going to mask it again by dead leaves. Um, so now that we have a few things in our foliage list again, I'm going to really quickly turn down the hill tree density just because um, I don't want you guys to be sitting here f waiting for it to go. So, um, just a disclaimer, you, this can be very fast or it can be very slow if you put in too many seeds. So you want to be careful and, and go in increments when you're increasing these things. Don't just expect to type 100 into steps and it to work. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of like with Turbo Smooth. You don't want to jump all the exactly. way up, all yeah. the way up with it's Turbo Smooth. It's processing a lot of data. Yeah. Um, and, um, but it's also very powerful what it's letting us do. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of the people are um, probably a bit curious here based on what I'm seeing. What we're, what we're using um, graphics-wise is we have a, uh, we have a 780 Ti. Um, and that's what we're using to run this right now. So it's not like crazy, but it's pretty high up there. Let's see if I can find one of those logs. Sometimes you feel like you're hunting things, even though there's millions of them, because they show up so sparsely. Oh, there's one. Oh, yeah. Right. Found a log. So they do show up in the trees. <coughs> um, and maybe some. Oh. So one thing we did a little bit goofy here in our hill tree setting, we forgot to set a max line angle. So the default of this is zero, which just means it aligns to the normal fully. For trees, I suggest never going any higher than maybe three to five. And sometimes even that looks a bit weird. So th you know, usually, usually three or so, what am I doing? Otherwise you kind of end up with these sideways yeah. trees. So when we fix that, and again, this is another reason why the seed-based generation is awesome, because we just changed one setting that won't actually affect the collision. Um, when we re-simulate, the only thing that we should see change is this tree turns straight. Of course, watch me be made a liar. <laughs> All right, good. So that shows that the, um, the seed system that we have set up is actually working out pretty nicely. So it allows you to do kind of iterative bug fixing on your procedural system without having to you know, throw the entire system out. Um, so for the grass, I mentioned before, you guys see that this, this pink stuff, wherever we go, we're going to see a coverage of, of different foliage. And um, that's defined by the world machine masks. So I'm going to go ahead and show some of those real quick. Uh, I believe it is under. So if you go under visualize layer debug, and then you also want to go into the landscape tool. And I might have to disable grass so that we can see this a bit better. This is another really useful thing for people who are going to be messing with foliage and grass. Under Show Flags Advanced, there is separate show flags for both foliage and grass. 
excuse me, and that's really useful for when you're debugging, uh, say, performance issues or trying to figure out what's causing some weird behavior in your level. Um, so I'm in debug layers mode once again, and I'm just going to start looking at a few layers. So this is the heather layer, and that is the, uh, the pink flowers that we saw on the terrain. So this is the layer that's being used both for blending in the terrain pink uh, texture as well as telling the uh, grass system where to spawn the, the, uh, the heather. We can look at some of the other layers as well. We've got our, our grass layer is basically everywhere that's not steep, which is a pretty standard grass layer operation. Um, what is this one? This is river rocks. This is kind of like a scree pile texture. And uh, I believe someone else asked a question about this as well. Uh, you could definitely use this in some way with the foliage masking if you wanted to. In this case, um, I create a pebbles grass mesh. So we call it the grass system on terrain, but really it's just very small deco objects. You can use dead leaves, grass, uh, rocks, pebbles, whatever. Um, so this is kind of the scree piles layer. And then dead leaves. This is what we're using for our tree layer. So the nice thing to point out about this in terms of shape wise is it's kind of masking out any little local hills that you get it's kind of like the average lowlands of the landscape and that's kind of a simulation of if this was a real eroded landscape where would the terrain be moist and where would where would plants favor to grow like they're probably not going to be on the tops of the hills where the drainage is best you know unless you have some species that likes that behavior like and you could e you could easily encode that with different masks um so that's the different landscape layers. And you can and you can use the three different colors to show off like oh three yeah. different ones kind of at the same time, right? Yeah, I wasn't really making the best yet. Although I feel like this is kind of like, what am I looking at? Yeah, <laughs> at this point it's it's a little visually I'd rather I, I prefer to debug these one at a time so you actually know what you're looking at. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's definitely But But the cool. options are all there and pretty shiny. Yep, so we can go back to default. Oh, and notice we set our foliage to be missing before. So kind of interesting to see about how much of our ground is shadowed, but we can go ahead and set and use defaults again. Um, so grass, I think we didn't really go much into detail for that yet. You'll notice that I said grass, but we actually have kind of a variety. Even this bush here is in the grass system. And look at that, that's uh, Shane Cottle, one of the, the uh, artists we had working on the GDC demo who made most of the bushes and, and uh, trees. Does some really insanely detailed ZBrush buds for non-growing nodes on these things. He goes crazy. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, you'd be shocked to see how much... Hopefully he releases a doc on how he made this stuff, but he went crazy. Um, let me load up these grass layers really quick. So, under landscape, we have a couple of these different types. Um, So for our, our main grass layer, we actually have five different things going on. We have our main, um, main field grass, and you see the settings here are pretty basic. Usually all we're changing is density. Um, placement jitter we usually don't touch. Um, cold distance, obviously you have to get that optimized so that you can actually run. And then there's a couple other settings that we really don't touch as often. So here we have the grass. We also have, I can't even read. <laughs> It's just another grass variant. So this is kind of an interesting technique that if you have one main dense grass that's kind of just a very plain homogeneous grass, it's also nice to have a variant that has kind of some brown wispy stuff, something just to break it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that this density is much lower than the density of the main grass. So what that's saying is that every once in a while you'll get this nice little tuft of brownish foliage. And you can see that here where, yeah, over here we've got some of that that instance, whereas over here in between is just regular grass. Um, and I'll just step through what else we've got in this layer. Um, and when it comes to the different objects in the grass layer, they're all going to be completely random within that layer. There's no control there. Um, here's the bog myrtle, which is this bush we had here. And you definitely could try putting something like the bog myrtle in a um, foliage simulation instead if you wanted to. It's just kind of a call to make whether or not you're going to have millions of them and you can actually afford to store individual positions or if you just want to automatically place them in the grass material, which is what we chose to do for the GDC demo. Um, and then the last thing in here is the field scabious, which this is when our other foliage artist on the GDC demo, Kendall Tucker, did this one, and it's pretty gorgeous. Oh, yeah, it's very nice. Let me see if I can't find one in the actual 
map that we go up to. Oh, saw it. Yeah. It's a little bit tricky when you're dealing with huge maps to find a sensitivity that works in all cases. But there we go. So there's the scabious, and this looks nice and fluid. So the heather. Sorry. Ignore the name of this layer, <laughs> if you don't mind. It's called green grass, but it's actually containing the heather mesh. So points to this guy here, which is another little, uh, just kind of like a, it was meant to be kind of the really small, kind of dark, but colorful at the same time foliage that you get in Scotland and parts of England as well. That just kind of blankets the terrain. So one thing that we actually did to help unify the transition between the grass and the heather when you're flying in and out is we use um, some macro color patterns. You'll notice in some areas the heather is very pink, in some areas it's more of a muted purple. So there's a, um, a material function that has a world-aligned texture that passes both to the terrain and to the heather material that helps those colors match up a little bit. Um, that said, it could have probably matched up a little bit better. It was one of the last things we actually did for the demo. Um, but I think there's a lot of power f to do really controlled blending uh, there. And uh, also, so, so far I mentioned these grass layers just in the, um, in the realm of masks that are directly on the landscape layer. But the way the grass system is set up, you can actually completely define where grass shows up based on a texture. Uh, and that could be a world-aligned texture. And um, I apologize in advance for the material graph you guys are about to see. We didn't have time to clean this graph up for, for today. Really should have made this material from scratch. But So the basic way that this works is inside of a material for landscape, you have a new input node called um, grass. Mm -hmm. And inside of that node, you have an array that you can um, place multiple grass types. And everything you add to the array will add a new input pin to that, I that node. And then um, you hook up whatever you want to be the input. So in a very simple case where you wanted the, the uh, painted or world machine alpha to be where the grass shows up, you would literally just hook, hook up the output of, of your landscape layer into the input of the grass node. Um, and in the case where you wanted to do something completely different, you could have, say, a wor world-aligned alpha texture that is hooked up into that input node as well. Um, all right. So I'm just going to zoom over to where the grass is. Sorry, like I said, try to ignore the complexity. So here is the grass layer for this system, um, for this terrain material. So you'll notice we have the heather, we have the grass, and we have the river rocks. Um, oh, I forgot to show the river rocks. Let me show that real quick before. Ah. Docking is not my friend today. OK, so this is that scree pile layer I mentioned. Notice that we have some actual real geometry rocks. And the density of these probably could be a bit higher, but it's just nice to automatically be able to have a few pebbles and stuff to just show up inside of that layer. And that's just an erosion layer from World Machine. And that's this layer right here. Um, let me just try to show this a little bit better. So here we have the three types. Uh. So if I go ahead and add something here, we got a new pin. So what this subtract stuff is here, is because I'm not using weight blended layers for these. If we want to not have, for example, grass draw on top of the rock layer, what we do is we subtract the rock layer from the grass layer. So it's kind of like a, a self-normalizing setup. You don't have to do it this way. You can do the simple case where you use weight blended layers and you just plug it straight in. But in this case, I'm subtracting down all the things that I don't want from above layers to, to contribute on top of. So it's pretty much just in this case, like you see I have Heather. Heather gets subtracted the uh, whatever this node is. This is my river rocks node. And this one up here is the, um, the dead leaves. So that just makes sure wherever we have the dead leaves or the forest texture, the heather is not going to draw. Um, and you can use world aligned textures. You could use a checker pattern, and it would automatically update all this stuff in real time. And to me, that's probably the most exciting part about this whole system, is being able to define the textures for the, the landscape and the foliage uh, procedurally in the material. Um, and I think there's a lot of possibilities there for stuff we haven't even had time to try. And I'm really excited to see what everyone is able to come up with there. Um, so at this point, I feel like I'm kind of running out of 
of new things to say. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, what, what yeah, time we use. I think that basically covers the, the gist of it. Um, we have about uh, 15 more minutes. We have a couple of questions in, but anyone that's uh, watching from the Twitch stream, you guys feel free to just pop questions right into the chat and we'll throw them up on the list. Um, we can keep going with the uh, ones that we've already got here. Sure, yeah, so let's we'll see where we ended. Um, so question, is foliage visual only or can we drive over bushes or crush them? Currently it is, it is visual only. And that is um, one of the things that makes it so quick to render. Um, mm -hmm. we, we've even had test scenes where we had multiple millions of trees and it was running okay. But that probably wouldn't be possible if each one of these things was a full class actor that was doing regular checks and logic. Yeah. But that, that said, there is there is things we want to try to do to make that possible in the future. Yeah, and it, it does seem like we are getting a lot of um, feature requests in for a kind of blueprint placement tool in the same way. So, so I'll definitely have to run that one up the chain. It's a, it's a good suggestion. The next question, can we put foliage on walls and ceilings uh, for ivy? And um, can't, hmm. can't read that other word. Uh, or is it only intended for ground? Lianas? So, so um, this there's two, two answers there. The procedural foliage, which is the one that actually stores positions for the actors, can spawn foliage on anything, which is why it worked in that other test map we had where the floor was a static mesh. Um, and it can work on, on any slope with the caveat that the way that the procedural foliage system works is it actually projects down to, to get the position. So at a ceiling, it wouldn't work, but a very steep wall, it could put it on. And in fact, there's another, s there's another setting for um, the foliage types called min angle. Um, where did I... So I already went over um, let me see. Somewhere in here is a slope setting. Ground slope angle. Oh, here we go. It's because it's on the same line now. So notice in, that in here there is both a min and a max angle. You could actually say something has to be a minimum slope before it spawns. And that's useful sometimes if you want a species to not draw, to draw on the flat grounds and you had a lot of rolling hills and you wanted it only on the side of the hill or something like that. But um, I'm not sure if that fully extends to the walls case. Probably not. Um, but you can definitely do, you know, blanket static mesh terrains in, in things in very similar ways. You just won't have the landscape layer masking, obviously. Okay. All right, next question. I know this is for foliage, but could it also be used to distribute other static meshes or instances of things, rocks, small structures? Absolutely. Yep. So Absolutely. yeah, we, we uh, had fully intended also to put uh, ruined castles in our Scottish demo. Um, it was one of the things we ended up cutting just because ran out of time processing 50 plus photo modeled assets with a team that was learning this entire process from scratch. Um, in fact, it was one of the things we were pretty sad about that we didn't have a castle to show that this was possible. Mm. But like we showed here, we have rocks and logs and whatever. The only limitation is that it's not using the actual collision for the overlap testing in those cases. But um, for the building case, that could be solved by just having the radius be the biggest radius of the object. And for rocks, it's usually not as much of a problem because sometimes we hand mesh things to overlap on purpose, you know, kind of jamming rocks together to build big cliffs. Um, so that one turns out to be not as much of an issue. Uh, the next one is, can this be used, used for, for uh, particles? Um, no, I don't. Uh, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. So there is a system for querying the foliage system for um, getting which types of trees are around. So in the GDC open world demo, we actually had a few particle systems that would show up when you went near forests, like there would be some dusty moats and things like that. And I believe also audio was based entirely on the procedural foliage locations. So it's a, it's a blueprint system that is able to query and return what foliage is near me, and you can make logic choices based on that. Um, so it's not so much that you're actually spawning the particle system to save in the map with the procedural tool. It's more <coughs> like when the player is near, you could have the particle system always draw where this tree is, or for example. Um, that's just one thing that you could do. <laughs> and of course, they're curious. Next is uh, the ETA for the documentation on it. Um, that is a great question that is a little bit too much for me to answer because mm, I'm not sure. And there's more than just me involved in, in doing that. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people. Um, 
and uh, we did actually want to show part of the Tech Talk slides here. We just for some reason couldn't get it uploaded. It's one of these silly things that happens. So um, apologies for that. But but anyone who's interested in more details here should definitely look up the GDC talk that was given by Francois Antoine and James Golding and uh, a couple other guys here uh, at GDC just a couple weeks ago because it has a lot of good information on uh, how all this stuff is set up and how some of the ideas come about. Okay. Uh, so the next question is about that. Uh, in the kite demo, um, the GDC tech talk, in one of the slides, you said the foliage trees and stuff have growth system. They can grow up, get older, dry out, die, and <coughs> seeds are sown from dead trees and new trees come from them. Uh, how will that <coughs> work and do you have a demo for it? And actually, I believe that's the generations. Um, so that's right. a little bit more elaborate than what it does, but the general idea is, is yeah. true that it does age and grow. <coughs> Excuse me. The one thing that we didn't actually have time to implement yet that was fully planned was the ability to specify different meshes that represent different ages of the same tree. So for example, you'll notice that a lot of pine trees, when they're next to each other, they grow in a certain phenotype where they're very tall, they have no limbs anywhere at the bottom or the middle, all the limbs are at the top so that they can maximize photosynthesis. But then any pine trees on the edge of that forest will tend to be bushier and take advantage of that side lighting that's available. So right now, that's not something that you can do automatically with the system. There are ways to kind of uh, try to do it by um, setting two foliage species to use the same initial seed and giving it a seed offset, but it's not guaranteed to work the same way as we actually want the age system to work. So that would be a, a big thing I'm, I'm pushing for and that we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to do it that works with the existing system. So that is a, it's a planned feature, but it's not going to be there on the, uh, the experimental release at 4.8. So Correct. It's not going <coughs> to be there quite yet, but planned. Um, so let's see here. Um, another question of 4.8 uh, include blueprints as foliage actors. Again, blueprints as foliage, uh, blueprints being used by this kind of placement thing um, noted. <laughs> uh, how well does this work with the navigation areas and volumes? Yeah, um, so I guess how, how well does this work with nav meshes and, uh, and all that? I, we got it all working with those deer, so I'm guessing so. Yeah, it, it works as far as I know. With the, I know that we still have a programmer who's working on improving and, and getting collision working fully. I'm honestly not 100% sure what the state of nav mesh is in 4.8 exactly. Uh, all I know is that somebody's working on it right now, getting collision to work properly. Um, all right. Um, Let's see. Um, can, uh, can it blend by slope, angle, and height? Uh, I'm not really sure. Yes, I mentioned slope, but I didn't mention height. Height is the elevation. Oh, okay. Which so. um, I know it's in here. So it's not actually height, or is it? Not ground. Oh, yeah, it is height. I'm blind. So here, the default min and max for this is around two kilometers above and below. So you usually don't have to mess with this, although um, there are times where someone creates a level below this negative two kilometer number and ends up wondering why. So it is good to keep keep an eye on that. Um, I haven't really used the, the height masking as much since I tend to want to use a layer that I can control the fall off. But yeah, you certainly could uh, use height. All right. Um, do we have any plans on having this work with the NVIDIA turf effects? I am not sure what the turf effect is. I'm not familiar with that one offhand it either. It, it, it sounds, it reminds me of isoline tessellation, which is something we had talked about as well. But uh, it's not something that's currently planned, but it's, we want it as badly as you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, looks like we've run out of questions for today. Um, We've got any very last minute ones we can take them in. Um, otherwise, I might wrap it up just a little bit early today. No problem. All right. Um, yeah, anything you'd like to throw out there about the tool and what's all going to be coming with it, what we should expect in 4.8 specifically, I guess? Yeah, I want to be careful about just promising features off, off the <laughs> cuff as much as I like to. Yeah, they'll hold um, you to it, so you got to be careful. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't even know what's in the build. I know it's what people are working on, but it's, it's hard to say. Um, other than I'm just excited about these different... Um, terrain material features that mix together with the grass and foliage system. I think it's it's pretty powerful and it's kind of a an untapped thing at this point because when you make a demo for something like this, you just barely learn how to use the tools by the time you have to be done. And so there's a lot of things that we just really wish we could improve on. So I know I'm going to be seeing a lot of uh, stuff that you guys make and being a bit jealous of how awesome it's going to be. So that's that's pretty much it for me. 
All right. And um, I looked I looked into this a little. I got a link here for the turf effects. And I guess the question really is if um, whether or not the foliage is going to be able to work with physics at all um, at, on any level. So um, I'm not sure full physics if that's something that's on the horizon or not. But uh, Gil Gribb, the programmer who did the hierarchical foliage rendering system as well as uh, most of the initial work for the, the grass system itself, he had said that it should be pretty easy to get characters to l to look like they're affecting the grass, like so that it parts and uh, things sway when you push past bushes and stuff like that, using kind of a um, more of like a motion offset system based on just simple vector math. Um, and that's something that we do want to get prioritized soon. Physics would probably be more difficult and more uh, further out than that. So <laughs> that's about all I can say. All right. Um, well, that's. Uh, Seems to be all that we have for today. I'll uh, be seeing you guys probably in two weeks on the next support stream. We've got uh, Fortnite coming up soon. And um, that's going to be it for today. So, yep, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you. Thanks, guys.